The next part of this lecture concerns enthalpy. As presented earlier, the first law of thermodynamics separates the change in the system energy into heat, which is disorganized energy, and work, which is organized energy. Work often involves a change in pressure, the inflating of a balloon or the raising of a piston. If we operate a chemical reaction under constant pressure, the change in energy of the system is only equal to the heat, and we give that term a special name, change in capital H, which is enthalpy. In future classes, you'll be able to look at the work change for chemical reactions and get the total energy change of the system. For Chemistry 101, we simply focus on enthalpy. So enthalpy is the change in heat at constant pressure. So we can make a substitution in our first law of thermodynamics. Instead of change of energy of system and change of energy of surroundings, we can substitute the change in enthalpy. And it turns out that the change in enthalpy of the system is exactly equal to the change in enthalpy of the surroundings but with opposite sign. Those of you with previous chemistry are probably familiar with the term endothermic. An endothermic process is a process in which heat is absorbed into the system. An exothermic process is a process in which heat is released from the system. I think that's kind of easy to remember because exo sounds like exit, so this would be when heat is leaving the system. And endo, n, sounds like in, so that's when heat is absorbed into the system. Since the system and surroundings are related, when the system is undergoing an exothermic process, the surroundings must be undergoing an endothermic process. Here's an example. Think of holding an ice cube in your hand. The ice cube represents the system your hand would be the surroundings. As a reactant, the ice cube is solid. Let's think about the enthalpy or heat change that occurs over time. Surely the ice cube will melt. That means that it goes from a low energy solid to a higher energy liquid when it undergoes this phase change. Meanwhile, while the system goes up in heat, the surroundings need to go down in heat, and surely enough, your hand will feel cold. So the heat change from reactant to product is upward. If we take the enthalpy change, we're taking the heat of higher energy products minus the heat of lower energy reactants, this will result in a positive enthalpy change. So this is endothermic. Heat is going into the system. Now from the surroundings perspective, endothermic reactions feel cold. This is because our hand is losing heat. So the endothermic process from the system's perspective is an exothermic process from the surroundings perspective and feels cold. The bottom line here is endothermic reactions have a positive enthalpy change and feel cold to the touch. Let's try this the other way. Imagine holding a hot potato in your hand. My father insists that when he grew up in Michigan, he was given a hot potato in the morning for his walk to school, and that was what he used to keep his hands warm, and he got to eat the hot potato at lunch. Also, it was uphill both ways in the snow. So if we think about what would occur if one were holding a hot potato in one's hand, what would the reactant do? Would it lose heat energy or gain it? Well, it would lose heat in going from reactant to product. And what would your hand do as you held the hot potato? Your hand would get warmer. If we look at the enthalpy change from reactants to products, we are now going downward in change. So if we look at the delta H, 
we have lower energy products minus higher energy reactants. That enthalpy change will result in a negative value, and we call that exothermic because the hot potato lost heat. So exothermic reactions have a delta H that is negative. Now, how do exothermic reactions feel to the surroundings? They feel hot because the surroundings are accepting the heat. In terms of enthalpy changes for phase transitions, this can be readily determined using a potential energy diagram. If we think about methanol, which is in a liquid state, going to methanol, which is in a solid state, that action is freezing. All we need is this lovely potential energy diagram, and if we draw an arrow from liquid to solid on our diagram, liquid to solid, we know that the delta H change is negative because the arrow is pointing downward. This means that heat is being removed in order to freeze something from liquid to solid, and that is an exothermic process. If we think about carbon dioxide in a solid state, going to carbon dioxide in the gas state, which is sublimation, when we draw that arrow on our diagram, that is upward. That tells us the enthalpy change is positive in value. Heat is going into the system for this phase transformation, and we call that an endothermic reaction. So enthalpy changes are state dependent. Why? Well, enthalpy is a measure of heat content or thermal energy, and we know from previous chapters that thermal energy impacts the state of a material. So gas is at higher potential energy than liquid, which is at higher potential energy than a solid. In order to define the enthalpy, we also need to know the temperature and the pressure. So chemists worldwide have defined something called standard state enthalpy. So it will have this degree sign or not next to the enthalpy change. Standard state is the most stable form of a material at one atmosphere and a defined temperature. Usually that temperature is room temperature, which is 298 Kelvin. Solids must be pure. Liquids must also be pure for their standard state enthalpy change. Gases must be at one atmosphere. And solutes, which we'll cover soon enough, this is something dissolved in a liquid, must be at a concentration of one mole per liter, which is also known as one molar or one capital M. Enthalpy is what we call a molar quality. That means it depends on how much material one has as to the amount of enthalpy change. I think we all know that a fire with one log will have much less heat output than a huge bonfire. The quantity matters. So if we think of the change of water as a liquid going to water as a gas, that is going up in potential energy. So that enthalpy change at standard state is positive 44 kilojoules. If we think of water in the gas phase condensing to water as a liquid, that is the exact opposite process. So the enthalpy change is exactly the same numeric value, but opposite in sign. This reaction represents the value for one mole of water. If you were to have two moles of water condensing, then we would simply double the enthalpy change to minus 88 kilojoules. So here is a student question. Given this reaction of calcium oxide and carbon and the enthalpy change at standard state, what is the enthalpy change for the reaction below? You might want to focus on the calcium oxide. For the top reaction, the calcium oxide is on the reactant side, and we have one mole 
For the bottom reaction, the calcium oxide is on the product side, which means this reaction has been reversed, and you notice instead of one mole, we have four moles. If you check the rest of the materials, you'll find that they have switched sides, and their quantity has been multiplied by four. So which one of these answers would that be? Here is another question. What is the enthalpy change when 19 grams of carbon disulfide condenses? You're given the enthalpy change for one mole of carbon disulfide going from liquid to gas. To answer this question, it would be helpful to know how many moles of carbon disulfide are in 19 grams. So let's do that first. So first, students would want to take the 19 grams of carbon disulfide and divide by the molar mass to get the number of moles of carbon disulfide. Next, students could take the moles of carbon disulfide and multiply them by this true ratio that says the enthalpy change at standard state is 27.7 kilojoules per mole. This would leave students with units of kilojoules. One caution, though. Students are being asked for the value when condensation occurs. You have been given the value for when evaporation occurs. So if one wants to go from gas to liquid, what should you do for the value of delta H naught? Please consider that when doing your calculation. Some enthalpies have very specific names. One of these is the enthalpy of combustion. This is the enthalpy when one mole of a substance reacts with oxygen at constant pressure. It is, of course, exothermic because when things burn, they give off heat, so the sign of delta H will be negative. If you imagine one mole of sugar burning, this is the balanced reaction for oxygen reacting with sugar to make carbon dioxide and water. And that enthalpy change happens to be minus 2,816 kilojoules per mole. So there's a lot of energy involved in having a sugary sweet and digesting it.